Hello again, this is Professor Lusheen. Uh, this is lecture six. Uh, in this lecture, what I wanna do is one, kind of cover the major topics from the textbook. So I believe this will be chapter seven, eight, and nine. Kind of leak, and, I, and I'm applying them to a pre-accident investigation, which can be called a visual hazard audit. It could be called a pre-walk around or whatever you wanna call it. So we're trying to prevent. On the screen here, I've got a picture of pre-accident investigations by Todd Coughlin. Dr. Coughlin has had this podcast for, it could be over a year now, and it's very popular. So if you're going to get into safety, uh, you'll probably hear of Todd Coughlin and his work with human organizational performance, or what they abbreviate as HOP. He sometimes speaks to this new movement called Safety Differently, which is an extension of Hall Nagel's Safety 2.0. That's beyond this course. But I would just want to make you aware of it because I got the book. I, I looked at it. It's really good, but it's not to the level we're doing it. We're going to kind of take it from the simpler level, which would be the OSHA level. After I cover these basic concepts, I'm going to show you what some work I had done, uh, some consulting work, and how I went in and did some hazard assessments for this company, and we used that to build their safety program. So here is the layout that Oakley gives us. I've, they, it's got chapters 7 through 12, and so it starts with more of a simple and then gets more sophisticated. So we're going to talk a little bit about events and causal factors analysis, change analysis, and barrier analysis. They're very simple, straightforward stuff. Uh, then in the next lecture, we'll talk about the tree cause and effect and specialized computer systems. And then at the end of the week, we will actually, no, I think on Thursday, so chapter, so chapter, uh, lecture 9, we'll cover 13, 14, and 15, which kind of wraps up the textbook, and then we'll be done with it. I want to call special attention to the accident scenario that uh, Oakley uses in each of the chapters. Um, I, I gave you kind of an oversimplified version of it here at the bottom of the screen, but um, I want to make sure you read that and you understand it, because I think he chose a good scenario to apply all these different techniques to, and I hope you enjoy it. So the first one is events and causal factor analysis. As you can see, it's. I, I think that sometimes they created these techniques for engineers because engineers think sort of visually like a puzzle and everything should fit together. And so they give them this visualization. So, so this has got the events and the causal factors and you're supposed to string them all together. And from that, and it, again, it, they call it it's chronologically. So that's why they that's where the event comes in. Event chronological versus fault tree analysis, which has got different components, and it's not so much a chronological. So this is a event, event, event leading up to it. And I want to bring you back to the video that I shared in the lecture, in which I talked a little bit about quality management. Do you remember the scenario in which they had the the statues were uh, uh, being cleaned too often due to bird droppings, and it was the spiders and the midges, and all they did was found that if they turned off the lights or left the lights off an hour after dusk, it reduced the midge population, which reduced the spider population, which reduced the bird population, and therefore um, the statues didn't have to be cleaned as much. So it's, it's, it's almost like just tracking back in time what led to this and then attempting to either moderate, um, monitor, or control those events. Control the events that lead the accident, the accident won't occur. The next is change analysis. I kind of like this one, especially for training. Make note of that, please. Uh, that there's a way something is being done and there's an ideal way to be it done. And by comparing the two, you can understand what needs to be done to change things so that it, it uh, I don't want to say evolves to, but moderates to more of a an ideal way to get something done. So again, there is the accident, and then there is the accident-free or the ideal, and you compare the two. And I think that's a neat way to do it. I think training should be based on this, that by involving workers and finding out how things are being done, uh, they can give you insight into deviations from expected or standard operating procedures, and you can build that into your training, and therefore you should be able to prevent injuries or accidents. The last is barrier analysis. This tends to be more designated to the control of energy sources. So a barrier analysis is ideal when you're going to do machine guarding or lockout tagout training. Um, and they've got this hazard barrier target, most common. Yeah, exactly. What you're trying to do is prevent human contact 
with an energy source or something that could harm them. And barrier analysis is a very good way to take it that way. And but that doesn't work for things that are non-persistent. Um, you know, slips, trips, and falls. How do you do barrier analysis that? Um, ergonomic injuries. How do you you know uh, a barrier analysis that? It's more for very specific um, applications, but it is an interesting way to plot it out. That's what all these are. It's kind of like the visualization of it. So I want to give you a little bit of advice, um, and I'm going to relate it to things we've already talked about, and that is hazard identification typically means that you have the experience to be able to um, say this is an issue, refer to what the standard or a consensus standard requires, and then uh, attempt to understand why it's there, uh, how it contributes to the work or the process, and then coming up with a mitigating strategy in order to prevent worker exposure to it, which is a combination of the things we just really talked about, but kind of simplification. So right at the top there, it's better, and I've said this multiple times. I should actually test you on this. Um, yeah, let's have the uh, the keyword of the phrase is um, each issue deserves. No, don't make it that because I'm just making it up as I go. But each issue, each safety issue or whatever you're doing, deserves its own attention versus operating by rule of thumb or by heuristics. This first one about keeping the place safe requires us to do regular evaluations of the workplace, and that's the general duty clause. The next is it requires a variety of techniques, and that kind of leans into the ANSI standard of the, the duties of a safety professional. The, th the new thing here is always document your work. That's something I learned as, a, as an engineer when I was in training, that you document everything. You almost keep a journal. Do I have my, I have it right here. I happen to have it. This is my journal. This is where I keep very important things. So it's always there. And then I use it to either make task lists or add things to my calendar. And that's how I track what's going on. So a lot of you probably just use your phones and electronic means. I'm old fashioned. I still use pencils. See, I still got pencils. Uh, but document everything because then you can look back. You may not know it's important at the time in which you document it, but you're going to be really glad when it's there when you need it later on. As engineers, when we find things and report things, we keep track of that because ultimately a lot of these decisions go to management. If management makes the wrong call, but you tried to do it this way, it, it's a way to support, yeah, this was the right thing to do. Um, and I'm doing a lot of that these days. Also have to keep in mind, each company is different as far as how you approach things, how things are documented, but you need to incorporate the company's philosophy into the th these things I'm talking about. Let's make documentation the key word for lecture six. So the key word for lecture six is document. I like that, okay? So on the screen here, I've got the primary duties for the safety professional. All of them kind of align in a way, shape, or form to what we're talking about, pre-accident investigations. So hazard risk assessment, I'm not going to cover risk assessment too much. I'm going to keep it to visual hazard. There are limitations to doing visual hazard audits. Uh, one is the time window because some hazards only present themselves visually in certain times during certain tasks or certain people, certain job titles will make it done. Um, and so they has that limitation. It also is limited to the evaluators or auditors abilities. Because uh, somebody may see something and they don't recognize or perceive it to be an issue, so therefore they just look on, which is an issue with somebody who uh, is is uh, responsible for the same work environment. The same set of eyes are going to see the same things, which is why sometimes what they do is they have workers trained to do auditing and then they have them go to different work areas. So they it, it, I, they call that a fresh set of eyes, um, and why some companies bring in consultants to do audits for them. Even though they have their expertise, they want to see a new set of eyes. And so that's another reason to bring in a consultant to do an evaluation. A good hazard assessment includes pre-work, um, reviewing of programs, uh, early research to find, because you kind of know what you're going to see, so you kind of you know, um, beef up your, your knowledge of those areas. Uh, you're looking at um, whether it's standards, whether OSHA or consensus, you're looking at the programs that are in place or the SOPs. Um, but then you're also going out and doing it systemically or st systematically. I didn't mean to be systemically, systematically, which means you go through objectively and not, you know, 
are kind of you know moved by, oh, my gut says I go here or there. Make sure you look at everything. You do include employees and supervisors in interviews. I also include them in my observations because it's, it's interesting when they see someone coming by with a clipboard is they might put something on or put something away or kind of run away to hide. I always kind of like go after that to find out what's going on. It gives you insight to things you wouldn't have seen. That's the way I do it. And then there may be some testing and definitely document what's going on. Uh, the actual, the ultimate controls that get adopted tend to be by management. And so the way in which we present our findings to management really dictates what it could be. And so being able to persuade management in their language within what's, what's salient to them. So things that are cost effective have a return on investment, which is something we are not going to talk about in this class. But we'll talk about it in my next class, 43. Training of workers and supervisors. When you identify something and you put in a control strategy, it becomes part of the safety program unless you eliminate it. If you eliminate something, it no longer is a concern. It doesn't have to be part of the safety program. But below anything, below not eliminating, it has to be part of the safety program. That's how safety programs are created. I identify an issue. I put in a control strategy, whether it's um, engineering controls, administrative controls, PPE, signage, training, things like that, it becomes part of the safety program. And I know that sometimes that's difficult to understand, but some companies go, oh, let's have this program. And then they try to go out and find out what it is. It should come from the initial assessment. Uh, and training is definitely part of that. And that's the way you develop the program. I'm, I'm talking too long here. I want to get to my examples. Um, I typically put this in the context of an intern uh, because this course is meant to prepare you, the student, to do an internship. So um, a lot of students are asked to review programs. You know, they get on site and uh, as they're getting acclimated to their new employer, uh, you know, they say, hey, why don't you review our lockout takeout standard or why don't you review our hazard communication standard? And a lot of students will email me and go, I don't know what to do. It depends on whether you're doing a comparative study or an investigatory study. A comparative is you just look to a standard. And that standard typically is OSHA, an OSHA standard that's applicable. Or it could be a consensus standard, whatever is prominent or whatever the company wants. And then you're just doing a side-by-side -side comparison, almost like a change analysis. Um, if it's investigatory, then what you need to go is, okay, so you have a program and you don't have any source material for it. Then you got to go out and you have to do the audits to find out how they do things. What are the concerns? How does it apply? Because maybe there is a solution the company didn't know about, which would eliminate the need for the program itself. So you know, let me give an example. So a company has this hearing conservation program. But then you go out there and, figure, and find out that, well, it's just these two machines that are causing or the source of the noise. And if you were to institute engineering controls and close them, uh, have a very strict preventative maintenance so that it runs and it doesn't cause as much vibration or noise. Now everybody's below the threshold requirement. Now you don't even need a hearing conservation program. You just need to make sure you maintain the preventative maintenance. And not everybody needs to know about that. So first is I like to look at injury data. You know, it's stuff that's already happened. It gives me an indication of what has occurred. And also gives me an indication of how well they keep their records <laughs> because I mean if you have a messy house it's like you know you, you kind of wonder messy house messy mind uh, messy messy workplace or messy records probably uh, issues with the safety program but it also gives me ideas of what to look for when I do my visual audit um, I may also from it come up with a list of people I want to talk to based on what the records say you can also adopt a checklist if you don't have these other things. There are a lot of different sources that we're going to talk about later um, in a different lecture where you could get a checklist. Then you go and you start collecting data. Um, and this tends to be the visual audit, tends to be talking and interviewing, taking pictures, taking video. Make sure you document everything. If you are, not, are uncomfortable with doing this type of work, this may be the time that you look into hiring a consultant, which is something that... You know, you, you could Google or ask around. You could talk to me and I can point you in the right direction um, because it's a new set of eyes and the time they're going to save you and the quality of the work they give you is definitely going to be a value to the company. You got to be careful because the, the data you collect needs to be analyzed. 
What I mean by that, it has to be put into a context to present to management. It has to be put into a context and in putting into a report or a presentation because without that, it's just your observation. And then the report and presentation need to be put in a language and I like to write mine in a sort of a story uh, so that it's, it's better consumed, better understood versus if you just throw you know, all the stuff at somebody and it doesn't stick, well, then it's not of any value. So the recommendations to management, you want to push the elimination. Eliminate it doesn't have to be part of the program, but that tends to be expensive. Um, they tend to default to the simple personal protective equipment and signage, which means they will, there will still be exposures and there will still be injuries. And if you can, if you can show them the value of eliminating something and the costs of injuries and other things that are associated with that, maybe they're more likely to uh, agree to the elimination or the high-level engineering controls. So what I want to do now is share with you some work I had done a long time ago. Now they look at the dates. Um, uh, a family friend who is a plant manager, I guess he's VP of something, VP of engineering, um, their company was inspected by OSHA, and he knew that I had worked for OSHA in the past. And I went over over the phone. We went over the citation package, and I believe okay, fifteen grand. That sounds about right. And it really wasn't the the amounts that concerned the company. It was just it just caught them completely off guard. They had nothing, no safety program. Nobody was really in charge of it. So I talked them through. I think they should have contested several of the citations. It didn't sound right to me. I think the uh, the investigator, the compliance officer, took some liberties in what they were citing, but they were offered something called an ESA, and you can see it on the screen. E-I-S-A stands for Expedited Informal Settlement Agreement. And so what OSHA says is, if you don't contest, we'll give you a 30% reduction in penalty. And it scares a lot of people that, oh, what are we going to do if I can test what's going to happen? And so they're like, a, a reduction just by not contesting? Let's close this and put it to bed. And so they take the 30%. That's what they did. But then they said, you know, we don't want to go through this again. Could we hire you to come in? This was my first consulting job. And so I'm going to share with you the results of three years of visits that I did with this company. So first was the 2004. Uh, let's see what happens. I'm going to try to cut these a little bit short. I'm just going to show you some of the uh, pictures. So this was the actual presentation without showing you who they were. So I looked at their record keeping. It, um, it had, a, had a lot to be desired, but an idea, had an idea, it gave me an idea, an indication of where their issues were. Their safety training was part of orientation, which was actually, I put scrunched, <laughs> compressed into one sheet. There's no annual training. They clearly focused on production. Uh, supervisors claimed that they had difficulty having workers even use the PPE that was provided um, and tried to convince them that engineering controls were better than that. So let's look at this picture here. They have multiple things plugged into a, an electrical strip or multi-strip. Sometimes they call it surge protector strips. These devices are only designed, and you can look on the label because it's certified by Underwriters lab Laboratories, and we'll get into that when we talk about electrical safety, for audiovisual equipment. So computer, TV, uh, DVD player, Xbox. That's all these things are designed for. But they had industrial equipment plugged into it. The industrial equipment has a bigger uh, amperage draw. A lot of these other audiovisual equipment, like one amp, 1.5 amp, and there's no, you know, um, run-up surge like you'd have on thing, anything that has a compressor, like a refrigerator or something like that. So this is going to overtax the components in this strip. When you overtax an electrical system, it heats up, and that heating can destroy uh, insulation or housings and then create a hazard for one, shock, if a person touches it and it's exposed to fire hazard. Here we've got a fridge that isn't plug, plugged into a wall outlet. All refrigerators, anything that has a surge that is compressor in it, has to be plugged into a wall outlet. They are designed to be able to function under heavier loads of amperage. And the, the circuit will, will, will 
you know, close or, or flip if it's overdrawn. Here, if you put things in the way of outlets, people are going to bend and move things around damaging electrical equipment. So the proper placement of these things is very important. Here they had a, um, I think it was an RO water tank and it was diked off and everything, but the, the electrical around it wasn't equipped with ground fault circuit interrupter. Any potential wet environment, you need that. It saves people's lives. More block panels. If panels are, panels are blocked, people won't properly lock out and tag out machine during maintenance. Here is an electrical box that was mounted to a, uh, a workstation and it's exposed. Those are exposed wires, live exposed wires that if somebody was to accidentally make contact with it could get shocked. And then they've got them mounted to the front of the workstation. So if uh, imagine if some individual's belt, if the, um, if the metal thing was sticking out and it accidentally went into the hot strip. <laughs> and that's what I told them. You can't put these where people could be exposed to it accidentally. Um, you, you could actually cite any broken uh, covers like this. And what we found out is that the cleaning crew that they had hired, what they do is they plug in their vacuum and they vacuum away from it. And then they use the whip technique to unplug it to get the electrical cord. And they're shattering these. That would be a citation. Here, if you run wires in and around sharp objects, especially metal objects, and the installation was to get rubbed off, you could actually electrify fencing or metal carts. Um, what did I put here? Pinched. Oh, you can't pinch cords either. Here they're pinching it into a uh, modular wall. Here they just had it sitting on the floor. <laughs> Self-explanatory. <laughs> it's a mess. These were engineers. Here they're actually doing grinding. So they had metal shavings uh, accumulating on top of an electrical pan electrical strip. Uh, electrical, the fire extinguishers weren't being checked. They had duct tape and other illegal things in their um, power center or switch panel. Uh, the lighting wasn't proper for exits. They were storing oxygen in a fire corridor. Can't do that. It would accelerate things. Any um, iridescent light bulbs under six and a half feet need to be guarded. This one was wide open. Imagine if that was a shatter. It would be a live electrical and a laceration hazard. Here's overhead storage. Um, you have to guard everything and just a, a chain would work for that. They were disabling uh, emergency stops. Can't do that because what if you need it? Emergency stops were located out of reach. Um, this was a charging station for a um, pallet jack and that means they add water to it. means you have to have an uh, apron. You need to have an eye wash station, face shield, gloves. Chemical storage, no rhyme or reason. They weren't keeping compatibles apart. Uh, compressed gas nozzles were not regulated below 35 PSI. And they had they were using um, lead-based solder uh, without proper um, ventilation. And so I gave them a little information about what you need to build a safety program. Uh, other recommendations, most of them related to electrical, some fire and egress, some emergency stops, PPE, chemicals and other little things I found. Gave them some recommendations on how to start building a policy based on what I had found. Gave them an idea where to start and I gave them a checklist of what they could do over the next year. So then they brought me back in 20, 2006. They wanted to show me what they had done. I'll show you. It's kind of great when you can build from previous work. So what I did is I, I just made a copy of the checklist and other things I had done in preparation. So I was gonna look at that stuff and look beyond it. Here I get a little bit more specific about what I found and what I did. I actually trended with a chart. It looks like things are going down. And it looks like they were going down. But again, their, their data needed to be better. Their record keeping needed to be better. And so I try to even break it down more by cause. So there are no specific trends here. Just an indication of what their prim primary causes are. Whenever you present to management, always start on a good note try to bring up something that's good. I want to say, hey, you know, I'm impressed. You guys are doing great. You want to put them in a mood to be able to listen to more of it. If I was to say you guys are doing a horrible job or these are the bad things, um, they probably would shut down or get defensive. Uh, so let's, let's get into things I had found. 
So they are now doing good stuff here. These were things they had completed from the checklist I left them. Um, now what they're doing is they're enclosing the oxygen so that it's not just sitting out. Look at this. Look how much better this is. They did such a good job. They're starting to put the things behind the desks um, and they're, they're, they're consolidating cords. Um, so they did some great work. Um, but there were some additional newer concerns. And one of them was the amount of musculoskeletal or ergonomic related things. Um, yeah, I did still find some, uh, broken and missing, uh, panel covers. They were going to change. They were actually going to threaten to, uh, drop their contract with cleaning crews and make them pay for all these. That's how they were going to fix that. Engineers will be engineers. <laughs> yep. Water cooler's not plugged into GFCI because if it's water, it could be wet. Still, a few things like a refrigerator or microwave are plugged into multi-strips. To be expected, it happens. Still found uh, that they were um, interfering or blocking merch stuff, but it's not as bad as it was. Um, they, had, they put in a chain for the overhead storage, but it needs to be taught. It needs to be up at a higher level. Still dumping some items into maintenance, some exit signs. See if it's if it's if it's flat above the side the the uh, door. You have to be looking or perpendicular to the door. What if you're down the hallway? You need to be able to see it. Um, still mounting some things to uh, metal carts that weren't grounded. I actually went on the roof, and they need a three-point contact that extends beyond it in order to safely ascend the ladder found some sagging or weak points in overhead storage toaster next to oxygen they did have a little bit of a water leak and a mold problem emergency eyewash is blocked though it could be fixed and i started looking into some other things that i saw sitting around oh i found this interesting fume accumulation on uh the diffusers now these are diffusers so air comes out of these things which means it entered the system somewhere else and we actually found that the they had some work done a couple of weeks prior and there was some welding done on um what type of metal um not stainless oh i forget it was a type of steel that's dirty and so now they were going to contact that contractor to come and actually clean out their ductwork because they had these fumes in it because it's welding fume. Here they had an industrial uh, coffee maker plugged into a household timer. These timers are only designated for a lamp. You can't plug in a, something like a heating unit, like a coffee thing. Here they were dispensing a chemical that you need a spring-loaded fail-safe close, but here was a valve. So if somebody doesn't close it all the way, it would leak, cause a problem. Yeah, there was a few other things that I found. What was interesting is I was actually, I spoke directly to the engineers who had them like this and explained the issue, and you'll see in the following year whether it worked or not. So I updated their checklist. I did compliment them on the things they got done, but again, it came back to what a safety program should look like, what it should contain. Then I came back in 2008. And we'll take a look and see what we found there. So again, I'm giving them compliments. Look at, they've got signage for arc flash. They're using lockout tagout effectively. What I say about the log? Luggage is continuing to decline. Um, look at all this stuff that they had improved. I mean, they were really proud of what they were doing, as they should have. Look at this. Everything's organized and cleaned. Um, ongoing issues. Yeah, there's still a few, but it's not nearly to the level it was. Um, you know, they're still getting to it. You know, there's still some things they could fix. But again, nowhere near what it was um, years earlier. Um, it looked like here there was um, an arc incident with this outlet. You can see the little burn mark there. That has to be replaced. Obviously, that means that that electrical component is no longer reliable. Um, I was showing that if you're dangling a, an outlet connection like that, when it's when it's open, when you can see the prongs, the metal prongs, that's exposed electrical. You could actually get shocked from that. Possibly arc it. 
Oh, interesting. They um, because they do uh, computer component uh, building, they have to have controlled humidification uh, due to the potential for static electricity buildup, especially in the winter months. And while I was there, there was a pop sound. It sounded like an electrical pop, and you could tell where it was coming from because there was a, like a bit of smoke, and found out that the the electrical coils that were heating the water source for humidification, it actually had been damaged and happened to pop at the moment I was there. I helped guide, you know, shutting down that system so they could open it. And what they found out that this was an unknown deficiency in the design of it. And so the company that sold them these custom humidification systems came in and checked everything out and then upgraded it. So it would never happen again because if the, the switch hadn't, jumped and it had actually energized the electrical chassis of these things if an employee came by and put their hand on it they could have been electrocuted and killed because it was a higher energy source i said here they need to put strain plugs on here and they agreed there were a few trip hazards there was a broken um uh a cord there we talked about um nfpa 70e which is the arc flash Talked more about ergonomics because I saw some more things and they agreed to it. I did analyze their work comp to find out where things were, where their money was going. And that helped convince them. And basically, they created a, a board, their safety board. And so they were taking, you know, they, they had a safety team who were responsible for going through on a monthly basis and 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 reviewing the work that I had submitted and working on the checklist and kind of revisiting the things I had done um, and they were finding it was working so much so that they had a follow-up OSHA inspection and they had zero citations. So they went from 15 grand and I think it was like six or seven citations to zero. And they actually got a letter of commendation from OSHA saying, you guys are doing a great job. We see the improvements. We see the work you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. And that really made them feel great. And where did, it, where did it come from? Did I come in and just write binders for them? No, I did assessment and I educated them what the right things were to do and where your injuries are occurring, what you can do to try to, to mitigate those things within the guise of work that's being done. That's how you build a safety program. It's through t over time and doing walkthroughs and talking to people and coming up with ideas and, show, and management showing a commitment to what needs to be done. And it takes time because you can't just change where like these electrical strips are. It, it's iterative. Over time, you find better ways to do it. And as you trial and error it, you figure out what works and what needs more attention. And that's really it. That's what I wanted to teach you about pre-accident investigations and how they can be used to actually build a program and prevent injuries.